So this is the first time we've ever done an episode of Culturally Jewish Live. Very excited to be here. I came all the way from Montreal. Michael came all the way from Niagara Falls. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Uh, to tell you about this amazing new podcast radio drama, Justice, a Holocaust Zombie Story, which I happen to also act in. And Michael and I have worked together for a few years now, since the early pandemic, on multiple podcasts. So it's actually the first time I get to interview him instead of him giving me notes on interviewing other people. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> let's, see, let's see how well you've taken my notes, Alana. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, a little bit about our show before we dive into justice. So uh, Culturally Jewish, for those who don't know, is an arts and culture podcast. Um, we've been doing it for a bit, has it been a year? A I little think it over started a year, a year uh, in April, a year ago, April. Yeah. Okay. And we have had on many different Canadian Jewish artists, everyone from archaeologists to painters to film directors um, and many, many more, more to come. So if you want to hear um, any of our other episodes, you can go to the cjn.ca slash culture. Um, you can also find us wherever you get your podcasts. So without further ado, let's uh, cut to the chase about, no pun intended, uh, this zombie holocaust blend. Um, that is not a genre blend that you hear about very often. I want to know the moment you came up with this idea to blend these two things. Um, I wish I had a good story for that. I don't. Um, Too bad. I don't remember where the concept came from. I can give you the context, which is to say it began as a pandemic project. Um, a, a little bit of background for those who don't know. Um, I worked at the Canadian Jewish News. I was hired in 2018. And then in 2020, due to the pandemic, it closed down uh, for not the first time. Um, pretty immediately, a core group of us who had been working there previously uh, said, we shouldn't have closed down. We should have just closed down the office and done this remotely. So it took us about a year to get things rolling again with a reduced staff and no office and fully remote and kind of revamp it into what it is today. And part of that reimagining was to do things a little bit differently, to come up with different projects, different multimedia aspects, right? The um, podcast department was a big part of that. Uh, and also um, uh, just coming up with stranger ways of, uh, of, of engaging with people, unconventional like ways. Like Holocaust zombie. Well, that's dramas. where this is going, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, in a nutshell, it was uh, an idea I had that was born partly out of um, a, a drive to get back into creative writing um, and partly uh, me thinking of ways to do something different with the CJN that would that would break out of the uh, there's there's an expression that's very common in Jewish journalism uh, not your boobies blank right ah. like Jewish marketing like this isn't your boobies Holocaust Museum this isn't your boobies uh, 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 Jewish film festival right well we'd want to be not your boobies Canadian Jewish news and so this was one way of of thinking of it a little bit differently okay and what were your hopes and also your fears about putting on a show that blends Holocaust and zombies? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I think I naively didn't have that many fears. Oh, wow. But it was partly because I knew from the beginning it wasn't going to be anything that was distasteful mm -hmm. or particularly... Like, there's a little bit of violence. It's not a very violent show. No, for those, silly. <laughs> for, those, for those who haven't heard... Um, who haven't heard any part of it, who you're hearing about it for the first time tonight, um, it's not like Night of the Living Dead. They're not eating brains. It's not a contagious viral infection kind of thing. The general premise is just that, um, and maybe, I don't know if you have a, tell me about the plot description oh, in yeah, your questions. Oh yeah, that would be helpful. <laughs> maybe I'll drop that in now. Uh, it focuses on a young uh, Canadian woman who in her 20s discovers that uh, her late father was Jewish. Um, and her mother didn't, didn't tell her and kind of hid this from her. So on this sort of snap, impulsive journey of self-discovery, she travels to Berlin where she has some estranged family. Um, and she goes to meet them. And while she is there, somewhat coincidentally, uh, well, Holocaust victims begin rising from mass graves as, as zombies. Um, she finds herself at the center of this. There are swirling uh, conspiracy theories and and um, a government intervention and things that, that kind of, uh, external forces that come and sort of try and manipulate the situation. Um, but she actually has contact, like they 
this isn't really a spoiler, but they befriend a zombie, um, and he's like a, a, a sweet, normal, he's, he's sort of like a Chewbacca or Groot type character. Like he's sort of fun and speaks in the sort of zombie Yiddish, and it's like, it's not a, a violence thing. Mm-hmm. Um, my goal with it was really just to um, try and make a commentary on the way in which uh, these certain global events, particularly with a Jewish slant, can be twisted and manipulated in a lot of different ways, which is something I'm sure we'll talk about mm-hmm. over the yeah. next little bit. Um, I think that's a great segue into playing a clip for the audience from the show. Um, this will be a clip from uh, the first episode. Um, there's a sort of dinner party. It's like the first scene of the first episode. There's a dinner party, and um, Kat's just chatting over uh, a Shabbat dinner with, with her family, and they're talking about things that are, that are happening and political events and things. Today, white Jews have white privilege. In Nazi Germany, they didn't. So, what? We changed skin color? How much longer do we have you for, honey? I've got a few more weeks on my visa. And then back to Canada? I think so. Dad. What? A century ago, you would have been fired from Humboldt just for being Jewish. Now they invited you as a visiting professor. How is that not privilege? Okay, so Hitler's gone. So what? What does that have to do with privilege? I'm sorry. We lost touch no, no, all these years. No, no. It wasn't my decision, obviously. All in the past. Have you seen what's happening at Sachsenhausen? That's just horrible. No, what happened? Holocaust victims in a mass grave. Their bodies are just dug up. Gone. Dead bodies. Who does such a thing? You know, it's been three days already. Nothing. No arrests. Police, they don't care. Now you tell me we should be privileged for this. Okay, that's really messed up. Kat, have you heard about this? No, I have not. It's a shunda. Here in Germany, in this decade, still we're dealing with Nazis. You think it's neo-Nazis? Why shouldn't it be neo-Nazis? Stop it with the Nazis. If they were Nazis, they'd be graffiti. What do you know from graffiti? You know, swastikas. Who's talking about swastikas? Nazis love swastikas. They put them everywhere. Schools, synagogues, garage doors. There's no swastikas at Sachsenhausen. That's my point. So it can't be Nazis. It's all those Muslims. Oh my they God! Keep oh my God! In. What? This country doesn't have borders what? anymore. That's, it's ridiculous. That is so racist. Racist? I know. If I lost a pound every time my daughter called me racist, I'd be thin as a rake. All right. Enough politics. It's Shabbos. So let's unpack a few of the themes of justice. First of all, as you mentioned, you wrote this as a pandemic project, which actually coincides with the rise of a big social justice movement with the BLM, George Floyd protests, and everything that followed um, as we've all lived through uh, to where we are today. Um, How was the story, as you were writing it, influenced by these world events? Was that a conscious decision to include these themes? And can you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, yeah, absolutely, and unavoidably. In fact, because it took four years to write, uh, it actually has some like references that feel a little dated to the pandemic. Like there's a scene toward the end where they're outside of a hospital and there's like people who are yelling at nurses and they're like, right. "Why are you yelling at the nurses?" And it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's a throwback. Like that feels like a dated joke. Um, but yes, it does. the The idea of the social isolation that led to um, assumptions and conspiracy theories and fears mm-hmm. about something that was going on, borders being closed, which happens in this play as well. Mm-hmm. Um, all of that was a was a direct influence in in the the at the very least the way in which they respond, the characters and and the government responds to the rise of of the zombies in this production. Mm-hmm. And since you are a journalist, I couldn't help but notice, since we've worked together closely for the past few years, the little references that you included in the script, one that stands out is um, my character, Tema's brother, Jacob, has a um, Holocaust tattoo on his arm. And I remember we had a whole conversation back in the day, I think it was on Bajor Chai, um, about that article that had come out about the two men who got their like grandparents' Holocaust tattoos, and it was extremely controversial. And so to me, as I was reading the script for the first time, before we even recorded it, I noticed all these little tidbits. So how, as a journalist, um, did your work inform writing the piece? And in what ways was it helpful to be in the loop? And also, did that create difficulty fictionalizing it, since you're so used to working in a medium that's all about fact? I'm 
while while I enjoy creative writing, I'm actually not that creative of a person. I don't know. This script is pretty creative. But like, I need to ground it in a thing. Like, it needs to be quasi believable. Like all the all the the references to the camp Sachsenhausen that's an hour north of Berlin. That is true, right? Mm -hmm. He teaches at Humboldt College. I was like researching colleges where like a visiting foreign professor may teach that has a chemistry department that offers an MBA. Like I, for myself, I needed it to have that level of detail and, and to extend it even further. Um, what we're doing here with the Toronto Holocaust Museum, uh, the, this is a, a, a minor spoiler, but you know the, the, the zombies rise in part due to Nazi experiments mm-hmm. that were done on them in the camps. And in particular, Sachsenhausen was one of the more, I don't know if it was one of the more prominent, I don't know, but, but it, it was a, at the very least, prominent um, uh, camp where, they, where, where Nazi doctors did do horrific experiments mm-hmm. on, on Holocaust victims. And, and prisoners, and even soldiers trying to create super soldiers, injecting them with uh, methamphetamines and steroids and things like this to try to keep them awake for 16 hours at a time so they could keep fighting and that kind of stuff. Um, that kind of, that dark element of it, which by the way, we will be expanding on in a documentary episode as part of this series at the end um, in the collaboration with the Toronto Holocaust Museum. Um, that element was important uh, because insofar as this is an attempt at something that is educational, an attempt at something that, that has a moral, I wanted it to be as true to life as possible. I like to say everything is true except for the parts that obviously are not. Right. <laughs> right. So everything is true except for, you know, the zombies. I do have right. a question, actually, um, again, without spoilers. And I think it was the fourth episode that came out. My husband paused the episode and was like, I know obviously, like, Holocaust victims did not come back to life as zombies, but was there an experiment done trying to resurrect dead people? Was that part made up or is that... That one was made up. Okay, good to know. As as far as I know, (laughs) there were weird cocktails of steroids and methamphetamines and things that they were injecting people. Mm -hmm. They were injecting, um, like I said, their own own soldiers and trying to keep them awake, but then they also tested them on on victims. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm still researching this a little bit more granularly mm-hmm. uh, uh, with some scholars who the Toronto Holocaust Museum has put me in touch with in, in, in preparation for this documentary episode. So I, I can't say definitively, but aside from resurrecting the dead, it's true. <laughs> um, I want to talk a bit more about the name of this show, Justice, which is a huge theme. So each character is fighting for their own version of justice. You know, and you've talked about this at Ashkenaz Festival um, when we did a live reading of the show. You know, who are they really fighting for? Are they fighting for justice selfishly for themselves or do they really believe in the cause? Which I think is very timely um, right now in the world. How does that theme of justice relate to the Holocaust to you personally? To answer the sort of broader question, Mm -hmm. um, the, the core theme is... The core thing that I, that, I, that I wanted to analyze was the way in which people manipulate situations for their own advantage. And in some cases, it's, it's in the name of justice. They think they're doing something very, mm-hmm. very noble where they are the heroes and everyone else is a villain, right? I wrote this, like I said, I began in 2020 and I wrapped it up probably around the summer of 2023, um, which for those who are keeping track is before October 7th. Um, the themes became particularly more pronounced after October 7th, uh, though I didn't go back and rewrite it to any significant degree. But the, the way in which every character in this production uh, tries to manipulate, there's two situations really, and, and it involves people who can't speak for themselves. Uh, one is the zombies who can't really communicate their, their wants or, or, or their desires, and then the other one is there's a, a young girl um, a non-Jewish woman, a Polish girl who was, who was attacked, who's put in the hospital, who's hospitalized. Um, and because she's in a coma, she also can't communicate what she wants. Um, and so she becomes a bit of an icon for you know, right-wing anti-Semitic, uh, or not just right-wing, like far extreme right, like anti-Semitic actors and conspiracy theorists. Mm-hmm. And so in both these cases, you find family members, you see the main character cat, you see the government, and you see all these various people who are manipulating the situation with their own agendas in mind. Um, and 
what I realized after October 7th was how true that is, particularly if, I mean, I, and, and I don't want to get too into it because it's not about the Middle East, but it's very easy to draw a, 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 um, a correlation yeah. When you look at the things people are doing in the name of Palestinians when they've never met a Palestinian or the things people are doing in the name of the hostages when they've never, they have no association. Mm-hmm. Like it, it does go both ways. There is um, a small reference in the script because Kat, um, so the, the character of Kat, uh, she's from Vancouver and she didn't grow up knowing she was Jewish. She didn't really know her father who passed away. And she discovers her Judaism um, and she tells a story about how she was at a protest and she was on the Palestinian side. And then this woman who was Jewish came up to her and was like, why are you on this side? Like you're Jewish. And that was how she found out that her dad was Jewish. So even if you didn't know you were predicting what was happening, there is some hints of it in the script, kind of some foresight. I didn't know anything about Judaism. I still don't, honestly. But on campus back in Vancouver, I was part of a lot of protests, right? And some of those were for Palestinian rights Don't even against say it. Israeli apartheid. Fuck, no, you're wrong. We're not getting what? into this right How now. Israel is How committing else is international a war crimes every week by destroying from a religious homes, minority tearing down the military 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 Saudi politics are boring. Yeah, there were pro-Palestinian rallies before October seventh that, that's that true. she could have plausibly been at. But no, you're right. I mean that yeah. that that scene in particular, they get into. That's the only time that that Israel mm-hmm. Palestine is brought up and it's brushed yeah. aside pretty quickly because it's not about that. Mm-hmm. But insofar as you can listen to it and you can think about the ways that it is reflected in real life today, I think I think it was a, a happy coincidence in a way that I have been thinking about it since it's come out. Yeah. So I want to talk a bit about audience reaction. First, before the show came out, we touched on this a bit um, at the live reading, um, and you shared that a lot of people were really offended at just the notion that there would be a Holocaust zombie story at all, and assumed that the actors definitely couldn't be Jewish, um, and that it was probably done distastefully and with no facts. Um, How have the reactions changed now that the episodes are out, if at all, or are you still getting hate mail? I actually, weirdly, mm-hmm. have not gotten any hate mail from, like, the CJN side of things. The, the, the anger I saw was on social media from strangers when I tried to spread the word about it on, online, you know, anonymous, not anonymously, but, like, to people I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm surprised I haven't gotten much hate mail. The, the, the letters I have gotten, uh, and this is extremely unusual in journalism, the few people who have emailed have emailed to say they like it. Oh, wow. And that never happens when you're a journalist. <laughs> People will only write to you when they want to call you a biased, right. you know, uh, uh, left, w- too far left or too far right, whatever, mm-hmm. whatever they hate, you're it. Uh, people never write in to say, that was a really good article. Um, but they did it, a, f- a handful of people did for this. Mm-hmm. Um, um, to be honest, the, the reaction is a little muted because I think it's just such a weird topic and audio drama is such a weird format that a lot of people just kind of don't get it and look away. So I think it's, uh, but, but it's not something that's very common in the mainstream. So, yeah. um, so but it, but it has, it has been, been supportive and, um, yeah. and I'm grateful. Um, I, I kind of want to unpack one of the things you brought up about the polar opposite reactions. Like, what do you think that is from a journalistic standpoint or, you know, from the standpoint of this show, the gut punch, like, oh, well, there's no way that this could be it, blah, 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 blah. Like that fire attack. Where do, you, where do you think that comes from? There have been studies on the effects of internet outrage on people. And it releases the same kind of dopamine hit, gratification, that, you know, other, uh, that, that other things do. Um, there is such a thing as being addicted to being outraged on the internet. I think this, like... Is that going to have, like, a formal diagnosis, like, name? <laughs> what the, Maybe right, one day, right now, Right now, the... The way the, things are going. Yeah, right now, the cure is just go outside and touch grass, <laughs> as they say. Um, Not a bad idea. But, uh, but, but right now, uh, yeah, there, there's no diagnosis as far as I know, but I'm no psychologist. Yeah. But, but there, people are very quick to write their opinion in an angry way and then... Uh, forget about it five minutes later. Oh, wow. Do you, do you think that there's an element, I mean, because I'm assuming a lot of the reaction you got was from the Jewish community, particularly, yeah? So, do you ever 
the, yeah, yeah, non-Jews don't even care about this. Yeah. Like if I, like I tried, I tried getting things. like the general like audio drama communities and they're just like, I feel like there's enough of them because audio dramas are pretty far left and like we, they kind of in that sort of like mm-hmm. nerdy comic left world that's like very pro-Palestinian by default. So I feel yeah. like, um, Too Jewish. and I've heard a little bit of this that's like, oh, you're just like weaponizing anti-Semitism just by even Whoa. creating this. And, and uh, uh, so a lot of people just kind of brush it off and not even care about it if you're not Jewish. So yeah, the only right. people who even care enough to be offended right. are Jews for sure. Do you, do you think that's like a, I, I know you're not a psychologist and I'm going deep into the psychology of this, but from in your opinion, like to me when I see these things happen, I can't help but wonder if it's a trauma response, like a Jewish, like, oh, I'm seeing this thing and it's this thing that I no, care about. No, I don't think so. You don't think so? I, I Just think road rage. No, I think it, well, actually I think it's fear. Okay. And particularly because it's, it's, we live in a post-October 7th world. There's mm-hmm. a large contingent of people who are like, why would you even do this? Why like, would let's you focus on October 7th, not or, release zombie and, Holocaust? And why would place? you draw any attention to it? Like, why would you do Jewish stuff that's like kind of controversial? Like this makes Jews mm, look bad. I see. There's a lot of that kind of self-defense and fear and things like that. Well, um, which mm-hmm. I mean, frankly, again, extends far beyond this audio drama. Just working at the Canadian Jewish News, if we were like, you know, we we published a a, a large article, a series of articles on JNF losing their tax status, and people are like, why would you cover that? And it's like, well, we didn't, re- we didn't revoke their tax status. What do you, don't you want to know the reason? That's what I say is when people, yeah. but, uh, but there's this general thing of like, why would you do this now? Why would you tell this story? Why would you put a spotlight on it? Right. And we should just not, which I disagree with. I want to have the discussion. I want to create weird yeah. art projects. I want to, you know, report on things and, and be part of the world For sure. and not just hide. Yeah, I mean, that makes me think, without getting too deep into October 7th, but, like, the whole do you take your mezuzah off your door phenomenon, I feel like there are those who are like, let's take it off, I need to protect myself, which is totally valid if that's you. Um, And then there are people who are like, we need to keep doing events that aren't just about October 7th, even though that's really important in order to survive as a community. We need to have fun. We need to do joyful things. And, I mean, I've had a number of people reach out to me who, uh, you know, in my family and friends who've just really enjoyed how lighthearted the, the show is, um, especially with everything going on. It's like nice to have fun Jewish content that isn't just about the war because we're all overly inundated with the war. So I think that that's a win. Um, Tell them thank you for me. I will. They're probably listening to this right now. <laughs> um, so moving away from, from the more uh, dark and difficult parts of uh, the themes of the show, I'd love to hear a bit about the behind the scenes. So Walk us through a bit of the process. So you, you wrote it during the pandemic, and then what, what happened after that that led to the, the product that we see now? A lot, uh, because it took four years to actually get it, to get the script, to, to, to make it. Um, so I started with a first script, a first draft, then I showed it to some friends uh, who work in the theater industry, and I wrote a second draft, and then my computer broke, and then I lost the second draft. So then I took eight months to even look at it again, and then I, wrote, I rewrote the second draft, which was, I needed to tweak some stuff anyway, so it was like a second and a half draft. Um, and then after that, uh, uh, my own dad passed away, uh, which happens to Kat in the, in the I, I had wrote that the main character's dad passed away before my own dad did. Um, but there was, it was, uh, in the span of one week, my dad passed away, and then one week later, my daughter was born. Uh, and in between that was Christmas. And it was, my wife's not Jewish, so that means something to me. Uh, and, um, and it was just like a very, insofar as this show does largely deal with um, generational trauma and connecting with history and connecting with, with your own family, uh, that made me go back and adjust the script more so. Um, and it, 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 you know, I, I tried to internalize it in, over a span of several months and then went back to it again. Um, and then after, I think, so it was about three drafts, once it was kind of solid, that's when I reached out to a few people I knew in the theater industry and was connected with Max Ackerman, who's a director of a little indie theater company in downtown Toronto called Dandelion Theater. Um, he had done audio drama before uh, and was Jewish and liked to make Jewish content, so that's kind of all you can that ask helps. for. <laughs> yeah. And after that, then we started reaching out to other organizations to try and find partners. I was lucky and, and grateful to the Ashkenaz Festival who signed on to, to be kind of a co-producer and the Toronto Holocaust Museum who's supporting us as well. So, mm-hmm. 
that's that's the the lengthy process. Yeah. Of yeah, when, between the time I started writing it and finished, I had two children and <laughs> lost a parent. So a wow. real real journey. Yeah. Now that you've been through it, if you were, and I hope you write more, uh, if, if you made another audio drama, what would you do differently in terms of process to speed things up or jump over things that now you're like, okay, I did that, I didn't need to do that. What would you do this time? A lot. <laughs> There's a lot I would do differently. Um, I would probably try to keep it a little tighter, some of the writing tighter, just to streamline some of the process, you know, maybe have like fewer moving parts. Um, I have a better sense of budgeting and things like, like the sort of nuts and producer bolts stuff, stuff, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, producer stuff. Mm. Um, the actual writing process was like the, f the fun part because mm -hmm. I could just sit alone at night and just like write things. What a uh, writer thing to say. <laughs> you know what, when you have two kids under the age of four, Sitting alone in, in your office moments. at midnight and just like writing stuff is like nice. <laughs> I'm glad that you had that time. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily change that, but yeah, there there are certain elements of it that I would change, and and with this project as well, I would change some elements of you know marketing and some script things. Like there, there's always there's there's never an end point, but you right. kind of you have to stop at some point. And since uh, this is your first time writing something that actually got performed, yeah, like by actors. Uh, post-university, yes. Post-university. What was that like, actually see us bring it to life? Like, did it match what you had in your head? or did You were it great, Alana, let me tell you. <laughs> you were fantastic. For, I'm not looking for compliments, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> uh, no, you were great, though. Um, no, it was... Uh, I mean, it, I, I wish I'd heard it more, and I wish we had more time to rehearse. Going back For to your sure. previous question, um, because I probably would have made more script adjustments hearing how some phrases sound awkward and things like that, but it's pretty sure. minute. Um, it was exciting. It was it was nice. It's uh, and it's 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 validating. I appreciate hearing the feedback uh, from the actors themselves. Two of the actors, two of the cast members, were the children of Holocaust survivors themselves. Oh, I didn't know that. You heard them earlier in the clip. The two parents, um, the two older. Uh, Actors are both the children of Holocaust survivors, um, and a couple other cast members also were father descendants, grandchildren. Um, and so to hear them talk about, you know, the way in which they respected and enjoyed the script was was gratifying as well. If uh, without giving away too much personal information, I'm curious in what way did, did it give them a sense of like, oh, I can explore this from a family perspective, or, or what what did they share with you? I'll, I'll give a special shout out to uh, Eva Almos who. Um, plays the, the mother we just heard in that, in that clip. Um, both her parents are Holocaust survivors. Uh, and uh, there were, her mother in particular, who was a very, very sweet and kind and supportive woman, uh, Lithuanian um, survivor. And uh, Eva loves to do an impression of her and has always like, grown up. She's a professional voice actress who moved to Los Angeles and she loves doing, doing her voice. She always considers it a privilege to channel the spirit of her mother uh, who's now passed away, of course, but but to channel that spirit and to do that voice for for a broader public, she said she she appreciated that a lot. That's so and she, lovely. Sorry, to be clear, that actually, it occurs to me that wasn't the voice you heard. She plays multiple characters. She also plays a Bubby who is a Holocaust survivor in the production. Do you remember the camp in Berlin? Of course, I remember. When you were there, did you know anyone named Moish? Who? Moish. I don't know his last name. Moish? Sure. You did? Of course. There was Moish Slimovich. Slimovich. S L I. Moish Goldstein. Goldstein? Not Slimovich? Moish Tenenbaum. Moish Levy. Moish Mendelbaum. Got it. He was a real cutie pie, that Moish Mendelbaum. What about one who. Was there any Moish who was experimented on? What's that? Did the Nazis do any cruel experiments on any of them? Did they take any of them away? Of course. They took them all away. I think we're done, guys. Uh, so before we open it up to the audience, I was wondering if there is anything else you want to share about what you're hoping audiences will walk away with from listening to Justice. The main takeaway, like I said earlier, is to challenge the way in which we um, can glom onto narratives and assumptions and... Um, you know, particularly activists can make themselves the main characters and distract from the actual, mm. 
the actual victims or the actual you know, people who they claim to be acting in the name of, right? They say it's about justice, it's actually sometimes just more about them and they like attention. Um, I, I don't. I wouldn't propose that. I wouldn't suppose that every audience member is like that. But but there's still a way in which we can hear a narrative, um, and accept it a little too easily these days. Mm-hmm. Um, more so now than I think in a in a pre social media age. And so I think that promoting that critical thinking mm-hmm. skill. I also like when I tell people about the show, I preface it by saying, I know this is going to sound offensive, but just hear me out. (laughs) And then I tell them about the show. But I think for me, one of the saving graces is that I think a lot of political views are represented within the characters. And to me, that made me feel less nervous about whose hands it will fall into. Like my character is very left wing. And then the character of Jacob, my brother, is very right wing. And the parents are kind of right wing. And like... You know, and then you have all sorts of other people in all different parts of the spectrum, uh, all the way to neo-Nazis. <laughs> Hopefully we don't have too many neo-Nazis <laughs> listening to I this, didn't give them too much of a sympathetic eye. No, no, think, no. But they're yeah, definitely painted as the villains. But um, other, otherwise, like, I feel like each character really comes from a different perspective. And to me, that also reflects, you know, the journalistic background of having, like, a, uh, an objective opinion of, like, each person really believes what they mean. There's no, like, looking down, or maybe a bit me, you know, calling up the parents in the scene that we listen to. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a good way for different people to relate to each character and maybe see themselves in another perspective that they didn't before. This is the part of our podcast where we share some arts listings, Jewish Canadian arts events that are happening around Canada. So we'll share a few with you. Uh, live, uh, you can write them down if you're interested, or we're going to put them in the show notes. This is going to drop probably tomorrow. Um, so, first of all, we wanted to talk about Jewish Futures, which I would imagine is probably happening in this building again this year. Yes? Yeah, yes. So, yeah. so, I had the opportunity to host a panel on it last year, and this year, Michael, you're going to be a panelist as well, yes? Yeah, I keep coming back to this this campus. They keep inviting me. Um, uh, but yes, I, uh, th- th- uh, it's happening on, on Sunday, November 24th. And uh, Jewish Futures, for those who don't know, is, is a UJA uh, arts event where they bring a whole bunch of um, arts workers, Jewish arts workers, either in Jewish spaces or outside Jewish spaces, uh, cut together for a conference, a one-day conference where they have different, different panels and things like this. Uh, uh, yeah, you it was did great. Last year, so yeah, it was, a, yeah, it was of a really networking amazing. edification event. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like the timing of it also was very, you know, important. It was very uh, maybe a month after October seventh. So I think at that time it was amazing to have Jewish arts workers meet each other and come together for something again joyful. Um, so unfortunately, I will not be at the one this year, but I hope you have a great time, and I definitely, definitely I'll, recommend it. I'll send you regards. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I definitely recommend it for those who are in Toronto or, or even not. Um, it would be a great opportunity to come in and network, meet other Jewish creatives. Um, I want to highlight a really cool uh, residency that um, is happening in Toronto and Montreal, Theater Dibbuk. So part of this is related to Jewish futures. Um, so Theater Dibbuk is an L.A.-based theater company that does... Um, devised theater, um, exploring themes of anti-Semitism um, through looking at old works. So they're coming to Montreal on no, uh, November 14th to 18th and Toronto November 20th to 24th. It's fairly similar programming except for I think they're doing a full version of the play in the Toronto residency and just a reading in Montreal. But for example, they're going to be doing The Merchant of Venice annotated. So they're not just reading The Merchant of Venice. It's their um, interpretation of, you know, this old play, is it anti-Semitic? What does it say about anti-Semitism today? They're also looking at Dracula. Uh, there's also going to be some workshops on, you know, how to create your own work. So I- I'm super excited. I'm going to be attending the Montreal um, residency. So super excited about that. Because this is a national podcast, the Toronto folks here will forgive me for giving a shout out to uh, a comic who's doing some stuff in the West Coast. Uh, on the West Coast, uh, there's an Israeli comedian named Eric Angel. I, th- I believe that is the pronunciation of his name. Um, but he's quite funny. He's a very rambunctious, kind of loud Israeli comic, and he's doing a, 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 a his show called Speaking Falafel on November 15th. Um, and he's also doing a, a West Coast uh, comedy for peace tour 
um, starting at UBC uh, in the same time. Um, and then lastly, I realize I don't have the date, but we'll put it in the show notes with the date. Um, Artists Against Anti-Semitism Auction. This was formed by Jewish authors in the aftermath of October 7th. Um, and it's to raise awareness on anti-Semitism and fight against hate. Um, so last year, the auction raised over $120,000 for Project Shema, which develops training programs that focus on depolarizing difficult conversations around anti-Jewish harm to strengthen alliances for and within the Jewish community. Um, there's lots more information that you can find on their website, theartistsagainstantisemitism.com, and we'll put the date in the show notes. I think that is it for now. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll the show notes. Give, give your plug. Oh, no, you, you go, you go uh, ahead. You know, I don't okay. know what's going on next week. You tell me all okay. the events. Please be sure to join us for more thoughtful programs in honor of Newberger Holocaust Education Week, HEW, known as as well. Uh, 2024, this year's lineup offers compelling ways to engage with the history of the Holocaust and its legacy. Newberger HEW officially launches Monday evening with opening night. Final verdict, Sarah Fulford, the editor-in-chief of McLean's Magazine, will be in conversation with Tobias Buck for a discussion about pr- post-war justice and memory culture in Germany. Be sure to visit the Toronto Holocaust Museum website for a full list of upcoming programs and any of the staff here today, which isn't included in the podcast, any of the staff here today are happy to answer any questions you may have about programmatic offerings. To learn more and register for the programs for HEW, you can visit torontoholocaustmuseum.org. Michael, it was a pleasure getting to interview you for the first time. I hope I passed your test. (laughs) Yeah, you did a good job. Yay. You can keep hosting. This is the the highest form of praise. You basically trained me. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. This was delightful. Thank you, Michael. And thank you to the Toronto Holocaust Museum. Mm